great pleasure to be here and um, good to see some some old friends and, and meet some new ones. And uh, uh, really happy uh, to have the opportunity to have really had some really excellent discussions with the faculty here so far. I look forward to my discussion with some of the students afterwards so it's on the schedule. Uh, right, so as Sebastian said, this is our our uh, skyline, that's the San Diego Mountains. If you don't know what New Mexico looks like, that's my picture of New Mexico. Um, and I'm uh, part of the uh, Center for Quantum Information and Control, uh, CQIC, runs with this quick. Um, and then, um, what I'm going to be telling you about today is, uh, in good measure, a part of a, a, a very long-term collaboration that uh, I've had uh, with my friend and academic partner of over 20 years, Paul Yesen, who's at the University of, of Arizona in Tucson, just a, a small jaunt of seven hours in the Southwest Drive. Uh, and Paul is an experimental physicist. Uh, I mean, there is, but we often get confused because we work so closely together with the theories of the experimentalists, and that's how it should be in physics. All right, well, um, it's time for final exams, so the first thing is a test. Does anyone know what Vanna White is going to be What about this one? Quiz show, exactly. <laughs> This one is game show. So why is it that this was virtually impossible to guess, whereas this one I got in a snap? Consonants. Consonants, right? And what is it about? Well, what those consonants gave you was information. There's a lot more information in this slide than in the previous. And the the lesson, I mean, what, what do I mean by that? Well, we, uh, Q and Z are letters that don't appear very often in the alphabet. They're very, very infrequent, whereas, you know, vowels appear in all kinds of letters. So this one has more information in it, and that has to do with what you bring to the problem. And that's the first lesson here. Information is about what we know. Okay. Information is about what we know and what we don't know. And when we gain uh, surprises like a QRC, that's a lot of information. So as scientists, uh, our challenge is to make predictions about the world based on our prior information and then our deductions about after the measurements we do. Okay, And we hopefully think logically in making those deductions. And the language of logic is the language of probability. So, you know, we do a, a measurement in the laboratory, we uh, see some result, and we have some prior knowledge, we have theories that tell us what we should expect to see, and then we try to deduce something about the data based on uh, you know, given that I saw a certain data, what is the probability that something is true? And we use conditional logic, for example, to make those deductions, right? Now, the deal is that, of course, quantum mechanics defies logic, at least the standard logic. So, if we wanted to ask ourselves, you know, what's the chance that that a photon will hit a certain place on the screen, if we were to think logically, we'd get it wrong, right? We would say, well, there's some chance that it went through this slit, and given that it went through that slit, there's a chance that it will go from here to here. Or it went through this slit, and given that it went through this slit, there's some chance that it will go from there to there. And that would just be the standard conditional logic, but that's not what's true. What we know that's true is that there's interference. There's interference between alternative histories that can happen. And so the quantum mechanics tells us that our just our general notion of logic is wrong, at least when it comes to certain kinds of predictions. Okay? 
Now, for fun and profit, of course, what we want to do with information is, is process it, right? There's all kinds of ways in which uh, we, we might want to communicate to one another, give away our secrets about our hobbies. Um, uh, we, uh, we might want to share or hide that information. Um, I'll have to work harder about hiding it. Um, or we might want to do a computation, like simulate the climate and see what's going to happen. And the, the um, deal of quantum information science is to see, can we make use of the new kind of logic, the logic that defies classical logic, to get some advantage, to do these tasks of communication and uh, uh, computation uh, in ways that we are more powerful than we could do if things, if our machines obeyed the laws of classical logic. Okay. Now, of course, beyond just is this a curiosity? I mean, we're kind of forced in this into this conundrum. Uh, if we just, it doesn't take a genius to look and say, well, okay, you know, if Moore's law tells us that computer features are shrinking and shrinking at an exponential pace, at some point, they're going to reach the point where quantum effects matter. And, you know, the, the, the pooping out of Moore's law has already happened. In some sense, tunneling, as we had learned about, is a real problem in, in, in some uh, transistors. So we're kind of forced into thinking about quantum effects, whereas, whereas quantum effects might be thought to be a hindrance my current leaks out because it tunnels through a barrier, the idea of quantum information science is to say, no, no, it's not a bug, it's a feature. And in fact, it's a, it's a tremendously uh, powerful feature. Okay? So our idea, the idea, uh, my idea, that goes back uh, to the pioneers in the, the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, is to try to use the power of quantum mechanics to do information processing in a much more powerful way. All right, so if we're gonna process information, we wanna think about the fundamental units of information. Um, the fundamental unit of classical information is the bit, zero or one, yes or no, and we can process that you know, basically in one way. Either we do nothing to it or we flip it. But in the quantum mechanical world, there's a whole other set of logical operations that just have no meaning classically. For example, the square root of naught. Okay, what's the square root of naught? Uh, well, oh, I guess I, I need to, I, I guess I, I missed the slide before I said that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to encode a bit in a quantum world in a, to what we call a quantum bit or a qubit. So the idea then is to encode the bit into two, for example, or for example, for a spin one half particle, spin up or spin down represents zero or one. Okay? And I can, it, those, that bit can exist in superposition as opposed to the classical bit, which is either yes or no. And with that, that's what I meant to show, is that we can do all kinds of lot, different logic. We can do something like the square root of naught. So what's the square root of naught? Well, the square root of naught is the thing that when you do it twice, is not. Right? In the same way as what's the square root of minus one. And if you just had real algebra, there, it's a meaningless statement. But if you extend the real line onto the complex plane, there's a whole other kind of way you can have. And this is the sense in which the quantum world extends the logical space, right? I can, the square root of naught is the square root of naught. It's the thing, and what that means here is that we represent our qubit where the north and south pole are the classical bit. The north pole is zero, the south pole is one. But there's a whole continuum of other alternatives that represent a quantum superposition of zero and one. So for example, the equator is an equals 
possibility of zero and one. But it's not just enough to say that I'm in the equator, where I am in the equator is important. And that's represented by the phase, as you, those of you who remember your Dirac notation, we have our, you know, quantum state here with a, a phase here that represents the phase of the superposition. So where I am in this equator is very important. It's a, this state is completely opposite to this state in the same way that this state is completely opposite to that state. So we have a new kind of mathematical and geometric logical stu structure now in this that's as powerful or more than thinking about going from real line to the complex line or the complex plane for, for processing information. Now, okay, fine, I got this quantum bit, but what if I have a bunch of them? Let's say that I have uh, three quantum bits or qubits, okay? Then there are eight different alternatives, right? Up, 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 down, etc. right? I can think about this as the binary encoding of zero to seven, all right? That's eight different possibilities. But all of these possibilities can exist in superposition in the same way that zero and one can exist in superposition. Now I have these eight different alternatives to do that. And such a state in superposition is what we call an entangled state. And what becomes most exciting is that in principle, well, the size, the number of alternatives grows exponentially with the number of quantum bits, number of bits. So with just 300 spin one half particles, to specify the state of that spin system would require more particles than there are in the universe if I wanted to store the quantum state, okay? Um, so just the num just just the, 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 the not even to say what the phases are, let alone put a couple of extra bits of precision to what the relative phases are. Just to say, you know, that there are all the number of alternatives grows exponentially big. So the idea, for example, of a quantum computer would be something like this. I prepare, let's just talk about a three-bit quantum computer. All right, this is zero through seven in binary. Those are the, the way we just encoded them, right? And I, I create somehow an equal superposition of all eight alternatives. Now, if I did that and I measured it, we know from quantum mechanics, right, you, you would just see one of these eight alternatives because when you measure the system, as you remember, it collapses onto one of the alternatives. So what did we gain by making that superposition? Nothing. Except if we have some device that is like a big interferometer. And the interferometer is very, very cleverly designed. Then it can cause interference such that one of these alternatives constructively interferes and all the other alternatives destructively interfere. And if this is the answer to my problem, well then I have in some sense sorted out an exponential number of possible alternatives and been able to, in parallel, run those things. So this is what is called quantum parallelism. The idea that I can interfere the exponentially num exponential number of different Regis classical registers all at once, this old map can uh, it, at the same time look at the solution to all the different alternatives. Okay. Now, you might be asking, come on Deutsch, what, what the heck is this thing about a quantum group? Why can't I just do this with a, with a, with a diffraction grading? Why, I mean a diffraction grading does that too, right? I have all the different slits and then I'll just put it through and have set up with phase shifters and beam splitters and have the right answer constructively interfere and the, and the wrong answer. Why do I, what's quantum about this? Anyone have a thought about that? Well, you could try, but 
but I challenge you to do that for 300 qubits. You would need the number of slits in the universe that you, with the number of slits you would need in your diffraction grating would be more than the number of particles in the universe. So these alternatives are not slits. They're in this abstract Hilbert space. And you really cannot, it's not just waves. Classical waves, that's important. It's the entanglement that's also important. Otherwise, you would never be able to fit those alternatives in any physical space. All right. Um, this is not the subject of uh, physical colloquia. You know, this is big business now. You may, or I've heard, I mean, there's a little, some amount of hype going on uh, in, in uh, the popular media. Um, about companies really trying to now build quantum computers. And there, you know, there's the arms race is going on, you know. Uh, sometime in November, IBM uh, announced its, its uh, 20 and 50 qubit arrays uh, to make a chip that could, I mean, we're getting pretty darn close to 300 there, it's just a few you know, factors there to get to that. Uh, and Google would have none of it. They have to take the crown back. And, and just at the March meeting, the APS March meeting, they announced uh, their uh, 72 uh, qubit processor. So um, it's a very exciting time. Yes, sir. How much are a lot of these things capable of doing as of right now? Or is it just a race of who's going to be the something with more qubits? Yeah, um, I, can, I think that's a good point. The answer is not a heck of a lot. I mean, we'll see. I mean, these are brand new devices, and so but I don't want to make any uh, judgment yet. They're they're just sort of announcing them as you know coming on board. The current, uh, you know, IBM, for example, has one of their uh, um, five qubit machines that you can play around with uh, via their interface, something called the IBM Experience. So through the cloud can run their quantum computer. It's a five qubit quantum computer. Uh, it's, I guess I'll come to, I guess there's an important aspect. There's, it's in some sense similar to uh, a nuclear weapon in a sense that there's a threshold. You have to have the pile at the certain threshold before you can get there. So to really to have run away until we have enough working qubits, it's never going to be able to do something particularly, in my opinion, useful because we need to do error correction. To do error correction requires a lot of working qubits. But to get a lot of working qubits, we've got to start somewhere. So right now they're just making error correction. Yeah, they're, they're in a qubit off, and also they're working towards getting this threshold. Right? So we've got to get there somehow, and we build it up. Now, part of this is, you know, yeah, there's, there's just, I gotta have my props for, you know, 72 versus uh, 50, but, you know, I, I'm not in business, so I won't speak for that. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. There is. Yes, indeed. Um, so there, there are different architectures for doing quantum computing. The one that I kind of introduced you to here is based on a, uh, the idea of quantum logic gates in the same way that we have binary logic with not and 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 or. And that model of digitization, even though the quantum state lives in a continuum space, the fact that the gates are our accountable number of gates allows us to correct errors. Okay, so this is what we're saying. We have to get to the threshold before we can do that. The D-Wave machine works more in a continuum approach based on, you know, Hamiltonian evolution as we think about it in physics. And that approach is not error correctable. And it's a question People like Sebastian are working very hard here at trying to understand what the power of such a machine is in the absence of error correction. It's unclear. 
Okay, so um, that is still a, an ongoing research problem to see what the power of such a machine that doesn't have this digital logic, can it really do something that we could not have calculated efficiently on my laptop? Jury's still out. Okay, so, um, right. So these devices, you know, they look like chips. They're actually based on superconducting uh, technology. The, the bit might be all the current going this way or all the current going that way in a superconducting loop, for example, which can exist in a macroscopic superposition. Um, however, to really, you know, as we still, we're still trying to know what the right, it's still, it's still not clear what the right physical platform is for something that many uh, are working on many different kinds of physical encodings of a quantum bit. Um, and as we can, as we're still in the stage of trying to understand how we're going to manipulate quantum information the best, there's still a lot of work to do at the fundamental physics level. And that's where I am. Um, and if you think about the fundamental physics, I would argue that the world's most quantum coherent device is an atomic clock. An atomic clock is based on the superposition, it's based on a qubit, it's based on the superposition of two spin states of a cesium atom, and we manipulate that coherence. And we can manipulate that coherence with incredible precision. I mean, this, the, here, uh, in Maryland, NIST, Gaithersburg, as well as uh, NIST in, in Boulder, you know, there's tremendous efforts in this. And one can achieve 19 digits of precision here, okay? So this kind of, I mean, this is, of course, these are gaseous systems. They're not talking about, they're not solid state systems. Uh, but um, they are a test bed for us to explore the possibilities of manipulating quantum coherence. And there's a lot of different aspects of that. Um, one way we might try to use, manipulate this quantum system is not just to do computations like, you know, breaking the code on your credit card, but do simulations of physics itself. This is one of the roots to which the idea of the quantum computer was developed by Richard Feynman in a famous work going back to the early 80s. Thinking about if you wanted to simulate condensed matter physics on a computer, it would be better if the computer obeyed the laws of quantum condensed matter physics, okay? That seems natural. So the idea is, I mean, even though our computers today obey the laws of classical phys uh, quantum physics, but only in a minimal way, or in their energy level, there's a band structure, but the logic of it is classical logic. It's not really the superpositions. So the idea here might be, I want to, for example, understand the mechanism of high temperature superconductivity. What I'm going to do is have some engineered quantum system, maybe based on ultra-cold atoms that I can trap, and have those, that system, in some sense, help me solve what's going on here. This is the idea of what's called quantum simulation. Yeah. on, on uh, what platform I'm talking about. Um, you know, one can do, I mean, it's a question of, again, there, there's a lot, there's many ingredients in that. It could be if I talk about an individual qubit, how well can I create a pure state of that? Well, if it's an individual atom, like a charged atom, an ion, I can, op I can cool that ion and prepare it with, you know, some number of nines of fidelity. Pretty darn pure. If I have a collection of a million atoms, 
that I'm going to try to use for a farm simulator, well, that's a different story. But pretty darn cold. And the question of how pure it needs to be might depend on the application you want. Right? So, you know, here's just a, just a, a kind of, of a, um, cartoon idea of what I might want to use a quantum simulator for. The idea is I don't know what's going on. I want to know the mechanism for high temperature superconductivity at crude freight. I create a toy model that we can write down that involves electrons hopping around on lattice sites colliding with them. It's not really what's going on in the crude freight, but it's a toy model that might exhibit some of the same properties. And so I now emulate this by creating some atoms that I trap in the standing waves of light that can hop around that are governed by this Hamiltonian and then I just measure I let physics do the work for me in the same way that I can integrate a differential equation by just picking up a resistor and an inductor and a capacitor and just let the physics integrate the equations instead of doing rug and cut out. Um, and this is the idea of let quantum physics solve for systems. So that's another avenue which we think about quantum information processors. Now, this goes similar to your question. This is not a digital approach. Is this approach going to allow us to reach what is called quantum supremacy? It's a kind of loaded word. Uh, meaning something that can't be emulated on a class computer? Oh, we're thinking about that hard too. All right, so with this said, in order to create these devices, in order to, to explore them, um, there's all the different ingredients. We need to be able, as we discussed, we need to prepare a good quantum state. That might be we take our plasma and put it and we try to encode it in a pure quantum state. We then somehow try to control it, evolve it, to a final quantum state and out. So all of these pieces are things we still need to think about and work on hard. And the part that I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that we've been thinking about in my group and in collaboration with Paul Gessen is the problem of quantum control. All right, so what do I mean by control? Well, you know, control systems, we often think about them in a kind of engineering picture with some kind of, you know, block diagrams like this. You know, I flew over here, I sure hope that plane had a, some kind of stabilizer control system. Um, and one often ha thinks about control in sort of two paradigms. We think about a kind of closed loop control whereby you have sensors and contingent on what they measure, they do something. That's what's called closed loop control. Or what is called open loop control. So here's a map of Albuquerque, and now I've given it away, this is where my house is, and I wanted to get to the airport, and I, I looked it up on uh, Google Maps, and I said, you know, how do, what's the best route to take to go to the airport? And there's a kind of algorithm that says, oh yeah, given what I know about the traffic patterns in Albuquerque, it's better not to go across Montgomery down to I-25, I should go all the way down here to I-40 and down. Now, I could make this a closed loop by you know, looking at my phone while I'm driving and adjusting, but if I didn't do that, you know, before this is, this is sort of, you know something about the dynamics of the system, and then you decide what's the best route to get from point A to point B. Okay? So, in quantum control, the idea is that we want to uh, get, say, for example, a wave function from point A to point B. Okay? Now, quantum control has a long history. Partly, it's been developed from the point of view of uh, controlling and probing matter on its natural time scales. We might want to understand sort of, say, physical chemistry and actually, instead of putting in enzymes and making something happen, we, we, we shine laser pulses to make molecules associate or dissociate. Or we might want to learn about 
things on the atoms second time scales, what's going on in, in the electronics of, of some material. But quantum control is obviously going to be a big part of any quantum device. Here's just a picture of an, an old-fashioned ion trap. It's a pound trap. There are, there are four ions which might store some quantum bits. I want to do quantum logic. I mean, you know, we can write a, a block diagram with some funny symbols in them, but, you know, underneath there is physics. You know, you lift up that an H and there's some pulse sequence that's making this go. We have to make it go right. We need a controller underneath our quantum logic gate that's going to make the quantum system do what we want it to, to do. Okay? And we can think about quantum control like we thought about classical control in either a closed loop or open loop paradigm. In the closed loop paradigm, there's a, an image I stole from Sergei Roche's uh, group, uh, one of the recipients of the Nobel Prize back in, what was that, 2014 or 16 or something like that, where they are controlling this quantum state of microwaves, photons inside this cavity by probing them with highly excited circular Rydberg atoms, and then they measure the Rydberg atoms, and then they feed back and they shine microwaves back in condition on what they measure. That's a kind of closed loop control, like the sensor of the airplane. But we can also think about an open loop kind of paradigm, where we say, oh yeah, this is some optimization landscape. So, uh, God, these are horrible. This is the yield as a function of parameters. And this is sort of what the yield will be for this chemical reaction as a function of some parameters of my laser pulse. And I just have to somehow climb to the top of this mountain. And if I know what that landscape is before I do the experiment, then I can just try to see what's the right path to get me to the top. That's what's as optimization, that's open. <coughs> Okay, so that's what we're going to look at in the next, whatever, 20 minutes. Uh, um, thinking about quantum control in terms of spins. Okay, so the system of the parquets are going to be spins, and spins are ubiquitous. They could be spins in a quantum dot, they could be spins in a molecule, like in standard chemical NMR, in liquids in a solution. They could be the spins of my ion trap or spins inside uh, neutral atoms that are trapped in light. Or not trapped at all, just falling. And they got a few seconds, or a milliseconds before they, they fall through my beam. All right, so that's what I'm going to tell you about quantum control of atomic spins. All right, so I know not everybody here is an atomic physicist, so let me just say a few things about our, our system. So this, the atoms that we often work with in these laboratories are alkali atoms because they have only one electron that are easy to manipulate, one valence electron that is. And so we're going to, the atoms are going to be in their electronic ground state and all of the three of the are in their spin. So we have an electron spin and then we have a nuclear spin. The electron spin and nuclear spin are coupled together through the so-called hyperfine interaction to give it a total spin for some unknown reason is called F. Uh, that's the spin of the atom. Okay? Um, and um, so the total spin of the system is the nuclear spin, and I can add angular momentum to get I plus a half or I minus a half. Okay? And the total dimension of the Hilbert space then is 2 times, you know, for spin i, I can have 2 i plus 1 possible projections. So the total number of those spaces is 2 times i plus 1. Cesium is the atom that we work with in Paul's lab. It has a big nuclear spin. It's been seven halves. So I can have a total spin f equals 4 or a total spin f equals 3 with 9 magnetic subload, same on cell levels here, or seven here. And the hyperfine splitting is about 10 gigahertz, okay? This is, these two states form the basis of the atomic clock. 
you know, the so-called clock states in these two states. So this is our playground. We have 16 slits in our, uh, if you like, in our uh, Gilbert space, in our diffraction rating. Okay, it's not a big one, but it's it's something that we can play around with. 16 ain't bad. All right, how are we going to control the system? We're going to control them with magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields are going to come in a few flavors. So this is a cartoon of the experiment in Pohl's lab. It looks kind of like this. I've seen it. It's not, it's really very clean. There's a vapor cell in there where there's atoms are collected in a, in a magneto-optic trap and cooled to a few microkelvin below, above absolute zero. Um, they, they form a cloud, that's a line around a few uh, microns across, tens of microns across, and then the atoms are released from the trap and they fall like pebbles, right? Galileo was right, an atom and a bowling ball fall, one half gt squared, it's the same. Um, but, you know, they don't fall far in that time, right? We're going to shine, uh, we're going to have, there's these coils wrapped around near the vapor cell. There's this, this coil, which is a, has a, a constant current, so it makes a magnetic field along this direction. And that breaks the symmetry. It causes Zeeman splitting of the magnetic cell levels. And they have opposite magnetic G factors, so one shifts up, the other shifts down. Then they have these other coils, this, which are formed transverse magnetic fields, transverse to the z-axis, and they are going to cause the spins that to bone more process around the, uh, their axis, and they are near resonant with the splitting, which is about at a megahertz. So the current is oscillating in this purple and green coil at about a megahertz. And then, in addition, we have microwaves that there's actually two horns that are shining into this and they have a magnetic field. You know, microwaves have a you know E and B. Uh, and the magnetic field is resonant with this transition at about 9.2 gigahertz. Okay. So that's our system and we're going to just drive the system with these three. This field is static, the bias field. And the only thing we're going to change is the phase. Alright, so the, the frequency is fixed. The amplitude is fixed. The phase is the only thing that's going to change. And I claim that with that we can make an arbitrary SU16. We can make an arbitrary unitary transformation in this 16th dimensional Gilbert space. It's not obvious that you could do that. Um, now, I just say a few things for Actually, really what we're using is group theory. So you remember, you know, the generate, I mean, I can think about rotation group. I can rotate around this axis, I can rotate around that axis, and if I just rotate around two orthogonal axes, I can make a rotation along any direction. That's the Euler angle construction, if you remember. We can generalize that to higher dimensional rotations in a higher dimensional space that as long as I have the generators of rotation that generate the group, I can, I can make anything I want. And it turns out that this system is controllable. It's controllable because these guys don't commute. Doing this and then doing that and doing this don't commute with one another. And because of that, these three subgroups are generators of the whole group. Okay, that's the mathematics behind it. So all we have to do, what well, we just proved, by I just, you just believe me because I'm wearing the jacket, uh, uh, um, is, that's why I wear the jacket, uh, is, is, is that there exists some control waveform which does the job. But I didn't tell you what the control waveform is. I just said the system is controllable, but I didn't tell you how to control it. Well, that's what the whole business of what's called optimal control is about. <clears throat> optimal control is saying, 
uh, can I optimize over my a set of control parameters in some way and that will enable me to achieve the control task with a high probability. And this goes back to work uh, from Hirsch Robbins' group, who is a physical chemist who was trying to, you know, break molecule bonds with lasers, to, that showed that in principle, the landscape is not craggly. I mean, the problem is if I climb it and I get to, you know, I think, yay, hey, I'm on the top of the mountain, but I'm on this small little hill. Well, I didn't get anywhere. But it turns out the landscape for these quantum control problems is more like this. Amazingly, there are no traps, and there are no false peaks. Every peak is at one. If you start and place a seed, you just have to climb the gradient and you'll get to the peak. In fact, this is an old paper now, going back to 2004. It's even better than this. I mean, back then they didn't know how sharp these, you know, some of them might have been very, very hard to find because they're very, they're very steep and some are easier to find, easier to climb out. It turns out they're all like this. Um, for reasons that I can try to explain to you at some point, but it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, so that's, now of course that is based on an idealized world where we have infinite bandwidth, we have no noise, we have no decoherence, we have as much time as we want, in reality, none of these things are true exactly, but they could be approximately true. So we can start with the idealized world and then see which seeds put our seeds that we find in our idealized optimization into a realistic model and see which one survives best and use that. So this is just a, just a, an example on a computer. So here's an example. Here's, a, here's the, uh, here's just the, our 16-dimensional Hilbert space, a state written here in a density matrix. So the diagonal elements of this matrix represent the probabilities to be in one of those 16 different magnetic cell levels. And the off-diagonal elements of this matrix tell me something about the phase, the superposition. This is what's known as a density matrix. Okay, And let's say I wanted to make this state which is a superposition of the spin with spin three this way and the spin with three that way. It's a kind of cat state of dead alive. All right? And I start with my atoms optically pumped and prepared, which I can do very well. Optical pumping works incredibly with lots of nines of fidelity to prepare uh, that pure state. And now I say, okay, computer, Siri, find the waveform that that takes me from this state to this state, given that Hamiltonian, and it spits out this. This is what it is. And so let's see if it works. So this is the time evolution of the Schrodinger time-dependent Schrodinger equation, what the wave function does as a function of time, as I step through that, and it does that. Now, this is not a unique solution. There's an uncountably infinite number of solutions. That it is. But what was the point of showing that movie? Besides, it's kind of fun to look at. The point is that there's nothing intuitive about this because in some sense, this is a representation that is meaningless for this problem. It's like looking at the six, or looking at interference between 16 paths in Hilbert space. But these particular, this particular basis is just giving you garbage. It looks like it comes at the end, but we just can't imagine. If we try to imagine what that, we couldn't have designed this, this thing. Okay, so with that, we can do all kinds of tasks. We can make a full 16 by 16 unitary matrix. There, here is a control sequence that does that, that comes out of the grade. Uh, or we can say, let's just do a transformation in a subspace. We're just going to do this block here. Or we can create one column of this unitary. This is a state. These 
correspond to different levels of complexity. And this has been done in Poe's lab. Uh, this full thing happens in 16 dimensions with an average fidelity that's over 98% success. So that's quite good. I, I would say that is the best fidelity that one can get, make for an arbitrary 16-dimensional Hilbert space on any platform. It's not just particular gates, it's an arbitrary case. Now, of course, it's not error-corrected, and I'm not trying to say this is the route to a quantum computer, but it's a good playground. Okay. So, the last thing I want to tell you about, all right, we made, for example, some superposition state. How are we going to know? Yeah, Jim. Were those experiments done on an ensemble of atoms? They are. Oh, okay. They are. They're done with about a million atoms that come out of a mott. And so that's why the signal to noise is so good in this problem. But each atom is its own individual quantum system. There's no interaction between them. But we just have lots of copies, so we can get lots of data in one shot. And that comes actually to the next point. Suppose I want to, I make, a, I've made this superposition. The superposition is 16 complex numbers that add up, the squares add up to one. How do I know I did it? And how do I know I made that particular superposition state? Well, that is the business of what's called quantum topography, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you about a particular set of experiments that were done in Paul's lab uh, that we, were, that we developed together uh, based on the idea of continuous measure. So, what is tomography? Well, tomography is the idea of reconstructing, for example, something like a three-dimensional image by taking different slices of a two-dimensional and, and then reconstructing what the whole three-dimensional thing was. And you would typically, you know, you rotate this around and you have some computer that tells you, given that you did this, what was the reconstructed image, okay? That's classical tomography. We want to take this idea into the quantum regime. So the idea is the following. Let's, I have this ensemble, as you said, Jim. I have a million atoms here. They're prepared in the superposition state. I want to know what that superposition is. What I'm going to do is, after I've made it, I'm going to turn on another set of microwave and RF pulses, which drives the system and rotates the state all over Hilbert space. And I'm going to take a picture of it. Now, the picture can't be too disturbing, meaning I'm going to shine light through it, and the light, was the atoms present an index of a fraction. I'm going to tune this light well off resonance, and it, it, the atoms present an index of a fraction to the light that manipulates the light, but that index of a fraction has got to be spin-dependent. So depending on the collective magnetization along this direction, I get some, say, rotation of the polarization by the Faraday effect. And then I'm going to get some measurement signal. And so then the idea is this. Suppose I know exactly, because Polyas is an awesome experimentalist, and he knows exactly what the magnetic field is, what the light field is that the atoms are hitting. And he knows exactly what he's measuring because he's aligned his polarization optics perfectly. Then the only missing information is what was the initial condition. And that initial condition is what is was the initial quantum state of the system. And so if I can take it, this is a this is like a fingerprint for the atoms. And I can invert this to determine what was the initial state. Now this will only work as you think about this for you. You might be thinking, Mike, but wait a minute, doesn't quantum measurement disturb the system? So how do you 
learn about it because you're, as you're measuring it, you're disturbing it. And that's true. But only up to after a certain point, you need to have, you have a large ensemble to do this because otherwise you cannot reconstruct the state of a, one, uh, you can't reconstruct the quantum state of a spin with just one copy. So that quantum back action, that quantum measurement back action is kind of spread out amongst the million atoms and it doesn't accumulate for a while. Another way of saying it is, I need to be able to, if I, I can't resolve the quantum projection noise over the shot noise of the light, I, I don't get any quantum back action. And I'm just looking at the expectation. Okay, so that's the experiment. Basically, the idea is we prepare that state with the, you know, those funky movies. We then apply another pulse sequence, and at the same time as we're shining this microwave horn in, we measure it, and then we do some estimate of the system, okay? All right, I'm running out of time, so uh, I don't think I really have time to explain in detail, but I'm happy to answer questions for the experts or anyone who's interested for that matter afterwards. How we actually do that? How do we fit our measurement record to invert to get back that? It's a bit technical, but I, I want to just instead show you the fun. Okay, so here is just an example. Let's say we, this is a god boring state, okay? We optically pumped into, you know, at one of these states, m equals 4, f equals 4. It's, it's all there, okay? Now, I can on my computer say, what is the measurement record I should see if this was initial state? Because I can model it. I know exactly, these are atomic systems. We know exactly the Hamiltonian. We, you know, this is the beauty of AMO physics. It's not like finding the top chord. Uh, so, right. So what's shown here in black is what the computer predicts we should see. And what is shown in red is the data. We are so proud of this. <laughs> uh, oh, it missed. Uh, but the point here really is a testament to the laboratory. It's saying that in Pohl's lab, they can create the conditions that are so pure that they obey the simple equations that my feeble mind can write down. Okay? So it means that. If we don't know this, we can now invert it because the only missing information is the information. So let's see how the reconstruction algorithm works. So as we gain more information, we the this fidelity, which was the one, is the overlap between our reconstructed state based on the algorithm that I did not explain and what we think the state should be. And it gets to, you know, 90. Eight something percent. Okay. All right. What about if we have? I mean, that was an easy state. Here's a random state. Now, I, this thing has both real and imaginary parts. This is just the magnitude of these elements. This is what we call a hard random state. We just pick a state in Hilbert space, which we can do because it sits on a surface, and we get a sample from that. Okay. The black is our prediction. The red is what the data is. It doesn't fit quite as well, but it's still darn good. Of course, it takes a lot longer to reach that information, but eventually in this system. So this is an amazing technique for tomography if you have a lot of copies at once, right? You can't just do that. If you just have you know, one quantum dot, this ain't gonna work. You need a lot of quantum dots, which you can probe simultaneously to do that. And in our system, we can, so it's a fast and robust way of doing it. And so we really can think about each one of these measurement records as a kind of fingerprint. It tells us, you know, this set of wiggles means every little bump in a wiggle in this signal tells us something about what the initial quantum state is.
we'd like to extend this to doing some more, you know, remember I told you about quantum simulators. What if we prepared some phase of matter like that appeared in the quantum, I mean, in, in a high temperature superconductor? Can we do this kind of continuous measure of tomography to extract correlations, not just what the individual state of an individual spin is, but the order parameter associated with something that's something different. All right, with that, I think I will conclude and just uh, thank the many people in my group uh, who uh, have been part of this, Charlie Baldwin, Izacho Gehi, Shuajong Chi, Ben Rangiola, Norris, Amir Kalev, and me without a beard, some people today. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, is there some very simple, straightforward solution that wants to that only one possible Um, to the degree to which, um, there is no noise in the system, if there is no other experimental uh, error, the answer is yes, it's unique. That is to say, what we say is that the measurement record is informationally complete. That is to say, there's only one quantum state that is specified by those parameters. Now, the reason we don't get absolutely perfect fidelity is because, of course, we're not doing a perfect measurement, right? So the Hamiltonian or the dynamics of the magnetic field that are occurring in the lab are inhomogeneous in ways that we didn't put into our model. The measurement itself, uh, you know, has some noise on it, the measuring device, and that adds uncertainty. But from a mathematical perspective, yes, it's unique. And so, the, the amount of noise that is yeah. there, you can discern between initial states based on... We can, indeed. We can. Uh, to some degree, with, you know, some error bars, right? And so this is not a perfect discerning. There are going to be some states that are too close to one another that we can't resolve them within the noise of our detection scheme. But pretty darn good. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. Question about systematic error. Yes. So suppose the uh, magnets coils are just misaligned a little bit. Yes. Still down the tubes a little bit wrong. And you start out in the initial state, and you make some state that you think you have, and then you manage to do the tomography, and you say, oh, yes, we have that state. Would you get the answer that, yes, you made it, even though you didn't really make no, it? No, we wouldn't. Okay. We would, we, so. Um, it, the, the fidelity would not be good. And I actually did miss that part of the discussion. So um, these waveforms that I showed you are actually um, ones that take into account a certain amount of systematic errors. So. This is based on, as you, you probably know, there's, in, in, for example, in NMR, there's a whole business of, of spin echo, right? Spin echo is a technique that allows me to do a robust pi pulse through a composite set of first rotate this way, then rotate that way, and then rotate that way. It's actually by doing it in a three-step process, I actually can remove some of the uncertainty. These are what are we call robust pulses uh, in that they account for a certain amount of expected inhomogeneity in the bias field, for example. You know, the cloud has a finite extent and it's sitting in a dipole field, so the different atoms are gonna see slightly different magnetic fields, which means that since we're doing this open loop, we better take into account and we so what is true is that there are many different paths in Hilbert space that lead me to the same thing, but I have to go around the long way. So these are robust pulses that build in a certain amount that allow us for a certain amount. Otherwise, it wouldn't work well. Yeah? So I 
assume that the uh, non monotonic rise yeah. melody is also yeah. because of noise, right? Uh, uh, rise monotonically. It okay. is. Yeah. It is. So, and, and, I was wondering, can yeah. you use, does that provide some sort of a fingerprint on the noise? Can we also back out some noise by crossing? We can. It's an interesting question. Um, we can think about this as a kind of sensor, right? I mean, it depends on which are the knowns and which are the unknowns, right? So if, in fact, the original experiments that were done did a combination of state reconstruction and parameter estimation. So, so there are some parameters, in, I mean, this goes to some degree relates to Jim's question, which is suppose there's a systematic error in, in the Hamiltonian that we didn't know about. Well, we can actually use the signal to deduce what that parameter was and then use that parameter to say, no, actually, when the experiment was done, we didn't actually have that magnetic field, we had that magnetic field, so this is what the fingerprint should be. So it is a sensor that can be used for both detecting noise as well as uh, Hamiltonian parameters. Including like a non system like a Oh yeah, things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, in some sense that I have to think about that more carefully. It's similar in spirit to what you might call process tomography, right? In process tomography, you have known input states, known measurements, but an unknown process in between, and you have to try to produce. One has to, I, one, I have to think carefully about Again, the uniqueness, how much I can do, but I think the spirit is there. Yeah. Yes? So, we spoke about the tomography. Yeah. I was so expected something to see um, uh, between the signal and the state, which is from the privacy by my expectation was from. Okay. So, what I would have expected was is that there's a simple relation between the information stored in the quantum state and the parallel correlation function of the signal. Looking at the traces of the signal right now, that seems not to be the case. Which is somewhat the signal for the very simple pure states, as well as the signals, the ones that are not that the ones So, why I don't know. So, to some degree, this goes to the question of uniqueness. Okay. In order to uniquely reconstruct the quantum state, I need to specify all the parameters of the quantum state. A quantum state that's an arbitrary mixed state in d dimensions requires d squared minus one parameters. So I need the expect, I need to look, I need those d squared minus one numbers. So for example, in the context of the spin one half, I slept over this slide, I can specify it by these three numbers. d squared minus one is three. Or a spin one half. And those three numbers could be the direction on the sphere that I put, right? The box. So the, the observables, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, represent an informationally complete set of observables. Okay. Now I could just directly try to measure x then rotate to y, then rotate to z. But that's not what we do. What we do is we have this, we're always looking at the z direction, and then we're rotating the spin around in a completely random way. Because we don't want to bias that the first, because the earlier measurements have less noise than the late measurements, because noise always accumulates. So we want to we just randomly move the, spin, the, the spin around the Hilbert space to get a uniform and unbiased covering. Over time, we extract the information about x, y, and z. But intermediately, it looks like garbage. So what we're doing is we're rotating in a hard random fashion in 16 dimensions in order to uniformly cover the whole algebra. And that's why it looks like a squiggles. Because we're not saying, first do this. We're doing it, they're just random waveforms. And that's enough to give us complete information. Okay, if 
further questions?